There, I spoke to James Elder. He's UNICEF's global spokesperson. He joined us from Gaza as the airstrikes took place. I've been coming here every day for a week and there are now children I know, I know by name, teaching a few kids to juggle, something to break the moment, to break the spell of, of what they're under. Um, and you can see gently, gently they... We can hear explosions again, again now. You can see the gentle change as they loosen, as they, that bit of childhood seeps back into them. That was gone again today. The fear, the trauma, the look in little boys' and girls' eyes as they see and they notice that, that look of their parents, that their parents are losing control. Their parents may not have the ability to protect them. That's terrifying. I sat again with a little boy I've been seeing, Rob. Um, Ahmed, he's three, he's lost his leg. He's not speaking again. He's absolutely mute. He can hear the sounds here. But yes, of course, the, the, the medical staff here, what to say, they're phenomenal. They, they, they never stop. I'm sure they never will stop. But the health system, as WHO says time and again, despite WHO's incredible efforts, it, it, it's exhausted. You know, you cannot, you cannot possibly, in all good conscience, start attacking the people of Gaza again and think that you will not have a massacre on your hands. So the health staff will keep going. My United Nations colleagues, they, they, they don't stop. They go to the front lines because in their heart they believe they can make a difference. And the, in the worst times, the most difficult times, is when they come to the fore. But they too have families. They too have children and loved ones who will be terrified right now as they, as they too are near the front lines. Everyone does what they can, yet it seems the only people who can make a decision um, are not doing what they should. James, if you and the team there need to get to safety, and of course anybody around you as well as those, uh, those uh, attacks continue, please do so. Please just stop and get to safety as fast as you can. In the meantime, just very quickly, can you talk to us about what you're hearing, the explosions that you were describing to us just a moment ago? Can you just talk to us about um, the sounds that you're hearing and how close they might be to where you are? Yes, I can. I have no military expertise, Rob. Just seen too much of this. Um, so the first thing you notice is, is the sound, but simultaneously, Rob, you just see in my peripheral vision or early when there are attacks, you just see people shudder, particularly children. You just see that reflex action that is becoming learned behaviour of, of fear seeping in. So, you know, it, it's a sound first and there's drones and I'm still unable to differentiate between what flies over and what strikes and then it's plumes of smoke. If it's close, then you hear very quickly, within a couple of minutes, screams, I guess, of family members of loved ones as they see the reality of, of another, another person killed. Um, and look, it's kind of you, of course, of course, we would move, but as we've heard time and again, there, nowhere is safe in Gaza. The, the people in Shifa saw this. I cannot imagine. I cannot James, imagine. James, if you, if you need, and the team need this, to get to safety, to do so. To this hospital. Uh, of course, we don't know what safety looks like. There are hundreds of children, Rob, in this hospital who don't know what safety looks like. The medical staff, there, there is no bunker here. It's not the Ukraine. No one knows what safety looks like. They, they, they know what fear looks like. They know what death looks like. Um, and and we, we pray that, that, that those who have the influence to, to stop this, to end the trauma and end the killing, also understand what their fear um, and what death for the children of Gaza looks like.